Hi everyone, welcome to the Watts 1010 Introduction to Web Development uh, Basic CSS Assignment uh, Walkthrough Demo. We're going to start out on the SU Web Dev version of this repository and we are going to fork it to our personal accounts. And once you have a personal copy, you want to clone that copy to a Code Anywhere dev box. By now, you should know that that means you're going to copy out the SSH clone URL on GitHub, and then you're going to go to Dev Anywhere, or Code Anywhere, <laughs> and you're going to create a new dev box. Um, this one, I'm just going to call it Basic CSS, and I'm going to paste in the Git URL there. I'm going to hit Create. Now that the dev box is created, it should copy over our files fairly quickly. It's just pulling all those files in from the GitHub repository that we listed. Now that it has copied over all of the files, we can uh, start to work on our assignment. So let's go ahead and get going here. Um, I'm probably not going to need the uh, command line too much. Um, but I, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, pull it down a little bit here so that I have a little more space to view whatever files I'm editing. Um, and I'm going to open up index.html here. And I'm also going to open up styles.css. So we can see that in styles.css currently we only have one style defined. Uh, the color is green. And... If we look over here, we have an H1, and I suppose we would expect this H1 to uh, be green when we view it. So uh, what we can do is uh, click the Browse button, well, or sorry, in, in, a, in a dev box, we can run the project, and we do see that in fact the H1 is green so that's great uh, we can see what the entire page looks like here now this is not the most um, this is not the best view I think for really editing uh, your page or previewing your page so what I would recommend to do is once you've run your dev box it gives you the URL that your dev box is running on you can copy that URL and then make a new tab and paste the URL in and then you can view your page with a full view and that means that um, you can also use your developer tools by going inspect element and you'll get your developer tools popping up into your uh, into your main window. Your developer tools will probably pop up more like this, uh, actually. So that's always very handy because with these developer tools, for example, we can inspect this H1, and we can in fact see that this. CSS style is being applied directly and that is coming from styles.css line 4 and so if we go into code anywhere here and we go to styles.css and we go we can see that on line 4 is in fact this h1 definition here so that's very handy uh, to be able to work that way and I think uh, right now I'm going to pull this bottom tab up here so that I can access my shell when I want to but I really just want to get this bottom area out of my way so because these are gonna get pretty long and already in the in the HTML here we have quite a bit of content so the first thing to do is to look through this content and really see what is what as we read through, we can see that the head is pretty simple. It defines the character set as UTF-8. Uh, we have this XUA compatible 
Now, what this basically does in this form is that it tells Internet Explorer that it should always use the latest version of its rendering engine. Uh, the latest versions of Internet Explorer are built in with uh, engines that will render differently for old versions of Internet Explorer. So if you had built your site and really targeted to IE8 or IE9, you could specify IE8 or IE9 here, and that would affect the way that the Internet Explorer uh, used it, even if somebody was using, say, Internet Explorer 11. Um, Edge means just use the latest version of Internet Explorer, which is going to be 11 dot something uh, these days. And uh, who knows what it will be in the future. So uh, We have a title for the page, uh, which is right now Watts 1010 Basic CSS Assignment. Uh, that title probably actually isn't the best title for this page, so if you wanted to search engine optimize that. Uh, we also have a description for this page, which is similarly probably not very appropriate. Uh, so if you wanted to optimize by improving the description. Uh, this is a meta tag. Uh, which is what search engines sort of take as the basic summary text for a page. Um, and search engines also get preview text in other ways, but the description meta tag is still fairly common. Uh, another meta tag that we have here is the viewport meta tag. Uh, this viewport meta tag, uh, basically what this sets is it's telling mobile devices that this page will just render it whatever their normal device width is, and that we're not going to uh, you know, do any special scaling or anything like that. So initial scale equals one is just the, the default scaling. And what that means is that um, it, it basically initializes the page so that uh, mobile devices who might be having trouble figuring out how to interpret a page, they'll, they'll know that they can display this page uh, according to the normal rules of, of mobile web display and, and this should, should basically work fine. Um, that doesn't mean that your styles and everything are necessarily going to look great on a mobile phone, but it means that a mobile phone will allow people to do things like pinch to zoom and um, will try to zoom and wrap and adjust uh, values as it normally would. And then, of course, the thing that's really brand new this week uh, that we will be doing basically forever and ever is a link tag, which is rel means relationship to the page, rel. Um, and the relationship to the page is that this link is a style sheet, and the style sheet reference is just styles.css. So uh, that style sheet is this other file that we can edit, and anything that we edit in there is going to come in. So this is a linked style sheet, an external style sheet that is being referenced here in the head. We could write our own styles in the head by putting style tags in, and if we did that, we might see something like this happen. So I just saved uh, a style that defines H1 as being colored red. And over here, if I refresh this page, you'll notice that my H1 now is colored red. And this is an example of CSS cascading. So this style is what is referred to as an embedded style sheet. I could write more styles between the style tag and the style tag could live in the head of my document. And it would override any styles that are defined in my external style sheet, which is this .css file that I am referencing through the link tag. So the external style sheet is referenced right here. I'll put a little comment there so that you'll see it. And the embedded style sheet is right here. Now, these are specific terms that we use to reference the cascading level of CSS. So external means that the style sheet is referenced through the link tag. Embedded means that the style sheet is defined between two style tags in the head of your document. Um, and then we have another way that we could modify it, which is that we could do an inline style So this inline style that I just wrote here, if I save this document and refresh, 
you'll notice that now it's blue because the inline style takes ultimate precedence over everything else. So those are the three different ways that you can add styles to your style sheet or to your, your HTML. Um, you can define the styles as an external style sheet. You can define them as an embedded style sheet, or you can write them as an attribute on any HTML element and you can make them an inline style. Now, all of these techniques are very valuable from a technical point of view. Um, inline styles are used a lot, for example, when you are modifying HTML elements with JavaScript, because it's not so important that um, users or other developers can read or maintain the code that's generated as a user interacts with a page in JavaScript, which is to say that JavaScript is written as a program somewhere else, and then the logic of that program is written in a completely different way. And so whatever changes JavaScript is making to the page are figured out through that program logic. And it's not really so important the mechanism that JavaScript uses to override styles. And because writing inline styles gives any new style a very high level of uh, both specificity and can cascading importance, then uh, you know, writing inline styles is a very good way for JavaScript to modify the styles on a page. However, um, it's a bad way if you're just writing styles that are supposed to be referenced and maintained by developers or designers uh, on a project because writing inline styles uh, mixes up all of the styles inside of the code and the styles that you write only apply to that one element where you put the style. Uh, obviously, you want to write styles that can apply to all of the elements on a page um, or even all of the elements on a set of pages. So uh, that's the advantage that um, that the other two forms of, of writing styles have. If I write a style in an embedded style sheet, I could at least uh, reference all of the elements on a page. So for example, um, to make this uh, sort of very vivid, Notice how this by Samuel Taylor Coleridge is a paragraph. I'm going to write an inline style here that colors it, colors this paragraph blue as well. And I'm going to save that and refresh. And what you'll see is that this by Samuel Taylor Coleridge paragraph is in fact blue. However, if I scroll down, all of the rest of the paragraphs on the page are not blue because this is an inline style that only affects this one element. If I write that style up here in the embedded style sheet, then I can make styles red, the paragraphs red. And so if I refresh, this first paragraph stays blue because it has an inline style defined, but all the rest of the paragraphs, you'll notice, have turned red because the embedded style sheet affects all of those tags on the entire page. And then, of course, in my external style sheet, I could add a style for paragraph. And that would affect anything else that referenced that external style sheet. I don't have any other HTML files here that reference this external style sheet right now, but that would make it um, affect any of this. And it won't modify, if I refresh here, I can see that it doesn't modify the colors of the paragraphs throughout this page because they are defined as in an embedded style sheet. But if I remove that definition from the embedded style sheet, then now we should see all of these paragraphs go from red to green because they will fall back to the next most relevant style which is the external style sheet. And so you can see that they are all green, in fact. So that is the basics of cascading and the basics of how uh, these styles get into your pages and how they affect your HTML um, presentation. Uh, so we want to be working with basically external style sheets and there's really no reason for us at this point in time to be working with embedded or inline styles. So I'm going to remove all of the embedded and the inline styles 
that I put in for um, example purposes. And I am going to work from this style sheet. So if I refresh now, you'll notice that now all my paragraphs are green and my H1s are green. And so I can start from there and start to make this page look a little, a little nicer. Um, so to do that, let's reference the guidelines here on the assignment uh, page. And we can see that we want to create styles that help visually group information. Okay. We want to remove bullets on lists where the bullets do not help with readability. Okay. We want to use at least one background image. We want to use two fonts. We want to use margin and padding to control the spacing. And we want to use line height to make the text easily readable. We want to use background color and color to alter the appearance. And we want to size the image that's included on the page appropriately. Okay, so I'm going to start with number eight here because that is annoying me how big this page is. So when I look here and I see how big this image is, I think that's really annoying. And as I look here, I see that this says more information and then it has this picture and it says for more information about Simon Taylor Coleridge, check out these resources. And I see that there's these things here. And when I look at the markup, I can see that this is an aside that has the class more dash info. So I'm going to assume that this image is supposed to be in some kind of, you know, different box. And so this aside here is going to be, you know, something, something that is going to be sort of like boxed up. And so this is kind of like small text, right? That's what aside means is it's, it's content that's related to the article, but it's not the main article itself. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is um, resize this image. And so I'm going to target it by saying inside of the aside that has the class more info, there is an image. And this is what that looks like um, when we actually target, uh, target these things. Um, I'm going to remove all of the styles now because they're not, those were just for example. Um, so I want to go inside the aside element. The way that I target an element is just to put in um, the name of it. And then if I want to say this is an element with a specific class, then I use the dot connector and I put in the name of the class. And what I've done there is, and I open the brackets reflexively because I do that compulsively <laughs> as I type the code. Um, but what I've said here is that in an aside that is, has the class more info, there is an image file. And that IMG just references any image tag that shows up inside there. And I'm just going to say the width of that image file should be 150 pixels. And then I'm going to say that the height of it should be figured out automatically. So what that means is that it will keep the same uh, image ratio, pixel dimensions ratio. Uh, <laughs> and you can see that my linter is giving me a little bit of help here. It says you don't really need to be so specific with the aside dot more info. You could just use dot more info. And that's true. And that would mean that it would affect anything that was classed more info, like a div or a paragraph or anything else. So for now, I'm going to leave it a little bit over specific, but you can always follow that advice and then um, sort of see how that, that works out in the long run. Uh, it could be a good thing. And in certain situations, it might, it might end up that you end up adding the aside back in. Uh, however, uh, for now, let's refresh this page and we'll see that, wow, we've got a much different page now. Now you can see that uh, we have around this image, we have a, um, it's, it's 150 pixels wide and then it's um, however many pixels tall that keeps it in ratio and the image looks a lot nicer now and is a lot, a lot more in, in the right spot. 
right? Uh, so we can um, we can address then. Uh, I think that's that's sized appropriately. We'll we'll enhance it and everything as we work more. But let's address this uh, create styles that help visually group the information on the page. So when we look at the information on the page, obviously we have this more information chunk. Um, and then we have the poem itself. And then we have some additional information about the poem, which looks like it's sort of like credits or something. And if we uh, look in the HTML here, we can see that we have the header, we have the aside, we have the section that's called content. And then we have the footer. And that's the content footer. And then we have the page footer itself. So, um, and then we have, uh, and, and inside of that we have page credits and we have citations. So, a couple things that we can um, do here. And obviously there's a lot here to work through and this is gonna take a lot of consideration by you. And I want you to you know, think about this, experiment with things, see what looks good and everything. But I'm gonna to try to walk through all the basics of, of how to kind of at least basically fulfill these requirements. Um, but I'm not gonna put the time in it that I, I sort of expect you all to put in um, here in terms of uh, working through all the different aspects of this. And I'm not gonna work through all of the different steps of the of the project, but I'll, I'm gonna give you a little bit more here. So what I'd start out with probably is just bracketing out these um, main areas. So right now I can see that there's a header that has a class page header, and there's the aside with class more info. And then there's a section with the ID of content. So let's go ahead and um, first put in uh, those things, right? Um, so we have header, which has the class page header. And this one, um, I'm just going to do this really quick. Um, I'm just gonna put borders around these things. And then let's see. Oh yeah, section. Uh, section with the ID of content. Oops. Note that when you reference an ID instead of a class, you use the, the pound sign instead of the dot. So this is a section with the ID of content. And I'm using this border attribute to just put a solid one pixel black border on these things. And after the content, there is a page footer. So footer dot page footer. So now that I have that done, if I refresh, you notice that now I've got boxes around these things. So I'm starting to get some visual differentiation. Now obviously I'm not gonna want um, these boxes around everything. And sometimes people don't like to work with boxes around things, they find that a little more difficult. Um, I'll show you another good way to do it is just to uh, say, uh, just pick background colors.
you you can notice too that um, if you start typing background colors, it'll it'll hint you, and there's a lot of background colors. You can Google for uh, CSS uh, colors, and um, you'll you'll get color names, and they're pretty great. Um, so now when you refresh, now you can see really how everything lines up. And remember the background of an area of a box. If you consult the box model, um, which is something that we will talk a lot more about in the future. Um, but the background area of a box includes the um, space of that that is visible. So th that's like where the background image would show up if you put an image, or um, if you put another background color, it would fill up this entire area. The spaces between uh, give you an idea of what margins and so forth look like. So you can really kind of see the different parts of the page. A lot of uh, web developers, as they work through things, will leave you know, test background colors uh, on on the page, you know, so that you can see kind of how things overlap and how things interact. Sometimes your final styles don't show you that as well. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea about how to start in terms of um, kind of uh, creating some visual grouping. Um, you can also, you know, reference things uh, you know, you apply a background color to the container and you'll notice that everything inside of the container now has the background color. So all these lists and everything, you know, still show the background color of the container. Uh, you could put different background colors on each of these things as well. Um, but then, you know, you, you run the risk of maybe getting a little intense, but it's very common to use, you know, lots of different background images and stuff that go together in a visually pleasing way. So, uh, you know, don't be too bashful about um, exploring uh, what can happen with background colors. Um, another aspect of what the assignment asks you to do is to remove the bullets on lists where bullets do not help with readability. So um, let's go here. I think in, I want to see, oh look, see light blue, light coral. That That's probably better to use light gray instead of, and instead of yellow, let's use light goldenrod yellow and instead of pink let's use light pink and let's go light sky blue that'll give us a little nicer to see the text um, for what we're going to do next so in this section content uh, we know that we're uh, we have uh, the poem here. So that is a unordered list with the class poem. So we can say dot poem and just reference the on everything um, that has a class of poem, which right now is just that list. And we can say list style type is none and save and refresh and you notice that all of our bullets now went away so that list style type is what allows us to configure uh, how our lists are and um, we can uh, we can do some pretty cool things there you can um, you can also uh, reference if you want to reference each individual line you could reference dot poem li which the li is a list is the list item tag so any list item tag that is inside of a list that has the class poem uh, you could um, do something like uh, you know font size large and if you do that we would expect this font to grow yep and just those lines of the poem grew, not everything else. So there are all kinds of other things that we can uh, that we can uh, work through and um, try out, you know, in terms of formatting and making those lists look really pretty and fancy and everything. And using this list style type set to none is um, definitely a good way of of handling things. Um, 
So we need at least one background image somewhere on the page. And if you look inside the images directory here, you'll notice that we actually have a few images. Do not be fooled into using the E.E. E. Cummings image. <laughs> and um, we have a hard paper texture, hiking the sand dunes, a sand um, image. And if we, uh, if we click here, we'll get a little preview of them, which is handy. We can see um, we also have uh, Xanadu marked on a map of Asia. So there's kind of that, that funky map thing going on. Um, and we have hard paper texture, which is kind of large. And all of these are kind of large background images. Um, so we can use them kind of in, in a lot of different ways. And certainly if you wanted to get fancy and if you know something about uh, image manipulation, you could create images uh, that, that do some pretty, um, some pretty cool things. Um, but for now, we'll just, uh, we'll just use the images as they are now. And so... As we when we define backgrounds, it's it's worthwhile to spend time playing with backgrounds and uh, and trying out all the different things that you can make them do. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff that you can do with backgrounds, and you can you can set them to cover the entire available area of an element. You can set them to scroll or not scroll. They can repeat or not repeat, so um, that they tile, uh, so that they can make patterns. Um, there's all different kinds of of techniques. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to just style the um, we're just going to style the HTML element. Now the HTML element goes across the entire page. Uh, we could style the HTML element or we could style the body element. Um, either way is is kind of fine. Um, with the body element, let's go ahead and style the body element, and we will uh, say background. Now you notice that we have background. Attachment, background clip, background color, background image, background origin, background position, background repeat, background size. And then, of course, there's a roll up background. A lot of CSS styles, you can define them as individual properties or you can like roll the properties up into one big definition. So, for example, um, I, could, uh, I could define like background image to be... Right to just be background image URL images sand JPEG and if I just save this and view this, you can see that the image sort of shows up everywhere, right? Um, my my backgrounds for uh, positioning stuff are a little bit problematic there. Um, I could uh I could comment them out really quickly and you notice that I have a, a keyboard shortcut for commenting stuff so I could you know use my uh, multiple cursors trick again and I'll just select these and then use command forward slash to comment those out <laughs> Uh, it didn't, didn't work as well as I thought it would. Nonetheless, we will move on bravely. Um, so I'm going to comment those out so that I can see the background that I'm playing with here. And as you can see, uh, it tiles pretty well. I think we can sort of see the seam, but it tiles pretty nicely. And it does that by default. By default, it tiles in both directions, X and Y. X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Um, and it's uh, just sort of being shown. We could um, change that. We could say uh, background repeat, set that to none. And if we do that and refresh, 
then we will find that this image is actually big enough that it no We'll, we'll allow it to only repeat X, and we'll see what it does. And as you can see it, because it will only repeat horizontally, it will keep repeating horizontally, but it won't repeat vertically, so we won't see it go up and down. Um, so, uh, we can also... Uh, And get rid of that so that it, because we probably do want it to. Um, we can also use other tools like background clipping, uh, the origin if we wanted to offset the image in some way. Um, we can also set the size. Uh, so a lot of the time, um, if we just said uh, background size is um, cover, then that sh that will stretch the image to fill the background. So this was the size of the image before. And now you notice that it's not tiled, it's just the one image stretched and you can kind of see the pixels and everything better because that image isn't tiling, it's actually stretching. Um, we can also say contain, which will stretch the image but maintain its own dimensions. And you notice that if it doesn't like anything that you put in, it will it will revert to tiling. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that you can mess with uh, backgrounds in there. Um, you can uh, also write it out uh, sort of all in one line. So for example, um, you know I can say top left. That's attaching the uh, background to the top left it will repeat X and the color can be cornflower blue and what we will see now is that we have cornflower blue background we have this image which is anchored in the upper left and repeating uh, on the x-axis and or we could have it anchored on the bottom right in which case it is at the bottom of the page so again lots and lots of different um, ways to modify it if you like learning the all-in-one um, setup that's totally cool otherwise you could also write this as otherwise you could also write it like this and you would have the exact same thing. See? So, that's how we might use a background. Uh, we're supposed to use more than one font on the page. And it says one font for the headings and another font for body text. So what I would say is I would tend to define, perhaps just on the body, um, font family, and I would set it to serif, and then that will just use whatever serif font the user has set as the default serif font is what it will use, and then what I would do is make a style that applies to more than one element. So, so far we've only used one selector, 
for each of our styles. We've, we're targeting the page header or the more info or whatever it is. Um, however, for this one, I think we should uh, write one that targets all of the headings. So H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. And so the comma is literally just listing them. And so the comma is how you separate your selectors uh, when you want to write multiple selectors. And for this one, we'll just say font family sans serif. And that will use whatever sans serif font they have installed as a default. And if we refresh, then you notice that now our headings are sans serif. And our all the rest of our text is still serifed and I have you know Times New Roman or whatever set so that's that's what it looks like so that's how you can uh, use more than one font um, using margin and padding is uh, really useful um, on the page as well so for example um, your header you might want um, to allow your header to uh, have some padding and I use rim to measure my uh, padding and margins um, those are relative M measurements so they're based on the size of the letter M in the font uh, as defined by whatever the operating systems sort of text spacing uh, processes are so rim tends to be very flexible and uh, very handy <clears throat> and um, what you'll notice is that now there's a much bigger space on the inside of this pink blob um, if I were to change it to let's say four rim um, we'll see a really huge space inside this pink blob see there and so if I switch it back to one rim then we can see it go back something and so this is now sort of sort of looking like a header like we might expect a header to look um, but notice that there's still some spacing issues there between the Kublicon title and um, the text by Samuel Taylor Coleridge it doesn't look like it really goes together and part of the part of the problem there and this is where your inspector can come in really handy if we inspect there and we hover you notice those orange bars that Chrome is putting up in the inspector show us that there's a margin set for the top and bottom of that H1. And so if we were able to lower that margin, then that wouldn't be so big, right? And in fact, we can see, um, if we look in computed here, that the margin is actually 21.440 pixels, uh, which is interesting. So, um, what we can do here is we can say, well, you know what? In the header, so if I have dot page header, inside of there, there's an H1 that I want to style specifically. So I'm referring inside of dot page header, that H1, and I want to set the margin bottom on that H1 to zero. And so I'm going to try to get rid of that bottom margin on it. So here, notice here, those orange bars show us the equal orange bars on the top and the bottom. And when I refresh, I now have the uh, orange bar gone. But the text didn't actually move up. So my style worked, but the text didn't actually move up. So the question is, why? And when I look at the paragraph, I see, oh no, this paragraph has margins as well. And I can see that that's the reason for the space is that paragraph's margins. So those margins were sort of overlapping, but they were both there. So now that I know that, I can though easily say, okay, well, that page header, inside of that page header is a paragraph that I also want to style. And I actually want to say that margin top put it to zero because I want that paragraph to tuck up underneath that heading. So now if I refresh, now that paragraph is all tucked up underneath the heading 
And when I hover, I see there's a top margin on the heading, but no bottom margin on the heading. And there's a bottom margin on the paragraph, but no top margin on the paragraph. So that's super useful. Now, of course, I also noticed that this 1816 is separated by a tag that says small, but it isn't actually small. So maybe I should say in that same page header, there's a small tag. And that one, I want the font size of that tag. Now, small is, is sort of relative because it isn't an H1. So I want to set the font size to medium and just see what it see what it does. So now I refresh. Oh, now the 1816 is a lot smaller. And that's handy. So those are the ways in which uh, we can target things sort of specifically in there. Now, we didn't change any of the other paragraphs or any of the other you can see that all of our other paragraphs still have the same kind of spacing that they had before. So it's all, it's all good. Um, so we use margin and heading. Um, we can use line height to make text easily readable. So uh, we talked about um, margin and padding is one way. Um, paragraphs and list items also have line height. Um, well, and, and other containers have line height as well. And that's just how the, how the text itself um, is adjusted. And the easiest way to see it is here on this poem, the line height on these, on these LIs is a little bit tight. So if we inspect these elements, we can click on them and we can look here and see that the font size is set to large. If we set the line height, let's say to 1.5, you notice how it will start stretching out the text. And if we change it to say 1.2, if we just make it one, we can make it 0 0.4. And you notice how it starts to overlap. So you know, we want a decent spaced out lines. You're reading a poem, so you want them comfortable. I think maybe this 1.8 is a good, good comfortable line spacing. So I'm going to use this line height 1.8. One of the handy things about working with this develop developer tools inspector is that you can fool around and write styles and see it right there, um, work out like we just did, and then you can copy right out of this and um, come over here and say, you know what? I'm going to go down to that poem. I already have that poem li style defined, and I'm going to add this attribute for line height. And that's, um, I'm going to put that right in there. And so now when I refresh, it'll look just the same. But you notice that now that, that is just permanently in there. So that's how we would use line height to enhance things. Um, we already talked about background color and color. Um, color changes the color of your text. Background color changes the color of your background. So basically, you're on the road to complete this assignment. Um, there's a lot of fiddling and futzing around and... Uh, trying things out and uh, seeing what works and everything. There's a ton to explore with CSS. Um, I, If I went over all of it with you, it would just be a series of really hours and hours of, of screencasts. So uh, I'm going to stop here. And um, you all know that the next steps are to uh, commit all your work, make a new branch to get a GH pages branch, and then push it up to GitHub pages um, the way that we have in previous weeks. So if you have any questions about that, post in the, uh, in the discussion forum or um, shout out on Slack and we will uh, do our best to answer them. Uh, for now, good luck finishing your markup and uh, making a really beautiful page. Uh, this is the basic CSS assignment. Enjoy. Bye.